my backstage will pop up the questions. Here we go. And the first question is addressed to Alex. If dynamic on resistance goes down as temperature increases, what happens at very low temperatures? So at, at low temperatures, a couple of things happen. First of all, your on resistance goes down because uh, you, your mobility of your carriers go up. So you have an improvement there. Uh, the second thing is that the ability of carriers to uh, uh, get energy, enough energy to get trapped goes up and therefore you get faster trapping. I actually have an image here that, that uh, let's see if you let me screen share. The host needs to do that, but uh, we have a, an, an interesting image showing that. Uh, and uh, the, the slope of on resistance over time is steeper at low temperatures. But uh, the, the bottom line is you can actually, you know, the minute a device starts heating up, the trapping goes down. Uh, and so it's really a very transient phenomenon at very low temperatures. Um, but we've actually measured it quite precisely all the way down to minus 40 C. And uh, you can also oscillate back and forth, hot, cold, hot, cold, and you get, you know, higher slope, lower slope, higher slope, lower slope, but it's, uh, it's all very uh, well regulated. So this is just an image of that, uh, where you can see on the top in green is the it temperature works. profile Great. Yeah. technology. On the top in green, you can see the temperature that we're oscillating back and forth. And on the bottom, you can see the on resistance and the, um, the lower temperature. The on resistance, of course, is lower, but the slope is higher. Uh, and uh, that's on resistance versus time on the, on, the lower, uh, on the lower slope. So we go back and forth and it goes to the higher slope at, higher temper at lower temperatures. It goes to the almost flat at uh, 80 degrees C. Is this a DC um, voltage application, Alice, or is it, are you switching? This is hard switching. Uh, this is ultra hard switching test, uh, the, the, uh, the JETIC uh, double pulse testing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and the overall percentage seems quite high. Um, we, we don't typically see that. The reason I was a bit surprised by the question is I don't think we're seeing quite that much uh, as a percentage of shift. Um, Are you talking about at the, low temperature? Well, we, we certainly have a temperature coefficient, but, but we don't seem to have the dynamic on resistance uh, to that degree, um, because I guess it's your slope, right? The slope of this uh, curve. So I'm just I'm trying to figure out what the percentages are here. I mean, it's, it's, uh, an, inter it's, it's an interesting data set, but I'm trying to interpret. Uh, it almost that slope doubles. It seems quite. It steep. almost doubles in ten years uh, at minus thirty. But I challenge you to have a device operate at minus 30, because the minute you turn it on, it, it comes up to a higher temperature. Yeah. It's a very yeah, difficult measurement. Thank you, Alex. All right. We are ready for the next question. The question is addressed to DJ at Nixperia. How does power gun fed manufacturing compares to SIC feds? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Um, obviously, this is one of the area where the GAN on silicon, obviously, when you say power GAN fed, we are talking about power GAN fed on silicon substrate. So the uh, power GAN fed on silicon substrate is more or less uses the silicon fabs and the silicon infrastructure. Uh, what it means that uh, manufacturing is scaling, um, everything is kind of compatible with the, the uh, silicon fabs. But on the other hand, if we are talking about the silicon carbide fabs, and uh, the manufacturing is a lot more complicated. First of all, you don't get the ingot size of a two meter, what you can get on the silicon a substrate that you use for the power gun fed. Uh, your, uh, the size of the wafer that comes from the crystal is very small. Uh, and you only get probably uh, 50 to 100 uh, wafers, not too many. And the, within the manufacturing process, you need a dedicated fab 
and you need a, in some processes need to have a temperature in excess of 2500 degree uh, your ion implantation that requires in excess of 650 mega electron volt compared to less than half in the case of silicon um, and the temperature for the silicon processor of the order of uh, 1200 or below so mm -hmm. Comparing all these things, basically silicon carbide fat uh, manufacturing is significantly more expensive. And scaling is also uh, difficult because moving from uh, six inch to eight inch uh, e for the silicon carbide fats is a lot more difficult compared to the power gain fats within the uh, uh, GANON silicon that uses the silicon fab infrastructure. I hope that uh, gives a brief overview of how does the GAN on silicon and uh, the power devices compared to the uh, silicon carbide manufacturing process. Thank you, Delje. Any comments? We may continue to the next question. My next question will be momentarily shown. It's addressed to Doug Bailey from Power Integrations. We believe that Mini ECAP is compatible with all inner switch ICs from Power Integrations, including the new inner switch 4. Please explain the benefits of the active clamp topology used in inner switch 4ZZ. Okay, um, so this doesn't mention GAN in the question, but I think I can clear that up. Both of these products are GAN-related products, so the, the person who framed the question um, probably assumed GAN here. Um, the, the the quick answer to the minicamp question is yes, it is. It's compatible with everything. What that chip is doing, it's a GAN device that is able to switch bulk capacitors in and out according to the applied voltage. So it allows you to use much smaller bulk capacitors when you're operating across a, a wide input power range. Getting down to the, the inner switch 4CZ, that's an active clamp flyback. And the, what the active clamp does is it, it, well, the observation here is that once you've got a GAN switch, which is very low on resistance, and you've got synchronous rectification, the next biggest loss element is the, the active clamp. And so what, what you want to do there is you want to save that energy and recycle it instead of burning it in the clamp. Uh, what we're trying to do as a company is move forward with um, uh, pushing the efficiency of products for that's a kind of our main um, the plank on which we judge whether a product is going to be a good product or not, whether we want to take the product forward or not. So we're pushing efficiency forward. And the idea of InnerSwitch 4 is you can do active clamp flyback with at about 135 watts without heat sink. So what, what's going on is you can build a transformer that has as much leakage inductance as you want, which means you can minimize interwinding capacitance. That means you don't have EMI problems or you can uh, remove, reduce your EMI problems. And then with that high leakage inductance, you can recycle the energy and you don't have to burn it in a resistor in the clamp. So it's a, it's a, a well-known um, technique, uh, but it's something that we've uh, introduced lately. And because it has GAN, um, the GAN devices in it, I think that's why the question was, uh, was posed that way. Thank you. Question addressed to every, all of you. How to increase pulse current for GAN? So uh, may, maybe I could start. Um, first of all, the, the pulse current ratings um, for, for GAN devices um, vary all over the map. Uh, and uh, nominally at EPC, we set them such that the junction temperature doesn't exceed 150 degrees C. Um, and uh, you increase the pulse current by uh, increasing, lowering the on resistance, for example, uh, increasing the amount of channel that you have in the device uh, but we are looking at increasing the pulse current. And I, again, I'll share screen uh, because we've discovered that, uh, that GAN, of course, is very, very robust. Uh, and what we're showing here are our tiniest devices. These are each one square millimeter devices. 
um, and uh, we subjected them to short circuit and uh, just measured where, you know, how long it took for them to blow up and what the junction temperature was uh, when they blow up. So you can see that these devices go to, you know, between 800 and 1000 degrees C before they blow up. In effect, uh, the pulse current that we found to be reliable on these devices is about double what we rate them at. Um, and so we're looking at increasing ratings maybe in the, in the fall as a result of that. Alex, do you, do you find that most of your customers are buying this kind of high current rating or are they buying RDS on? What, what's in the applications that you're mostly serving, what's the, what's the limiting parameter? So for um, uh, DC to DC converters, they're buying RDS on. Uh, for LiDAR systems, they're buying pulse current rating. Because uh, in a LiDAR, it just doesn't matter what the on is. It just matters how, much, uh, how many photons you can get out of a laser. So it really depends on the customer. So the next question will pop up now. How does the dynamic on resistance change with frequency? Um, uh, I have a, a slide for that one too. <laughs> um, we got, I just got an infinitely deep deck here, <laughs> but this is actually showing you um, the uh, effect of on resistance in this chart on the vertical is normalized on resistance. Uh, and on the horizontal axis, you have time with the right hand axis being 10 years. And all that frequency does is it shifts up. There is a weak dependence on frequency um, it's really the switching event um, that uh, generates uh, most of the trapping. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, as you can see, there's, you know, maybe a 20 or 30 percent effect going from 10 kilohertz to uh, one megahertz here. Yeah, I'm actually surprised, Alex, that the dynamic on resistance is so high. We're seeing you know, five percent, and then it recovers. You know, if you hit it for a few million strikes at, at higher than the rated voltage, it then recovers pretty quickly. But the effect is only like a five percent effect. Um, so I'm let me qualify that folks this. Are, are concentrating on this uh, this topic when it's well, well, I'm just surprised because our our effect is such a small. Yeah, I'm uh, surprised we, we kind of, too. It's kind of negligible for for our product. Yeah, our, our products, we see a very negligible effect on that one because we did uh, trillions of um, pulses and we didn't see th this level of shift. So first of all, these are 100 volt devices that are being hit with 120 volts uh, at 25C. So I think like, you know, like EBC, yeah, well, you're do. probably designing your devices so that they don't have dynamic on resistance up to the rated voltage. We do that as well. Uh, but we take our devices out to extreme conditions to understand the mechanisms. You know, here, let's see, I've got, I've got devices here, 150 volts, 100 volt devices, 150 volts. So we can really make them, uh, uh, you know, go to hell in a handbasket <laughs> uh, by taking them to very high voltages. But here you see the 100 volt, which has about a 6% shift in, in 10, 10 years here. Why doesn't it recover, or is it is it is it that you just you're continuing to switch? We're continuing what? to switch. Now I have to to okay. caution you when people see recovery in on resistance, it's a false recovery. What happens is you get mirror charges uh, that mirror the trap charge, and the minute you fire it back up, those mirror charges go away, and you're back with the same trap charges. Um, so there there is no. Um, uh, um, recovery effect, or it's extremely slow, I should say, uh, for the uh, the principal track trapping mechanism of hot carriers in the silicon nitride above above the barrier. Thank you, Alex. There is a question to Tom from Nevitas. At what frequency does it make sense to change from a toroidal slash bobbin transformer to a planar? Does it vary uh, by topology? Very good question. Um, yeah, I would say from our experience, so the, the main topologies we deal with using planar at the moment are QR flyback and also LLC. And I would say probably when you reach, um, you can already move to planar when you reach 
upwards of 150 kilohertz. I've already seen some designs where you can you can already switch to planar. It's not a hard threshold. There's always kind of a range there. Um, silicon can also, as the as the main switch, can also work up to um, in a LLC can also work up to about 200 kilohertz. And so you probably want to make the switch to GAN plus planar, um, you know, for definitely at 300 kilohertz. That's a very uh, comfortable range where you can start to use planar. And then on up, we have also designs upwards of 500 kilohertz. Um, that's where it really starts to take full advantage of the low leakage inductance and really the small size ultimately of the transformer. Now QR flyback cannot go as high as LLC because it has conditions at high line where you're hard switching. So there's other reasons why the frequency would be limited. But most of our QR designs today that are planar, um, they operate from 200 to 300 kilohertz depending on the line or load range and uh, they use planar designs. Thank you, Tom. Another question to Alex. Please, does EPC aim to develop GAN transistors with VDS breakdown voltage up to 600, 650 volt? Um, not at the moment. I mean, look at how well it's served by, um, by all the other folks like, uh, you know, Navitas and uh, power integrations and GAN systems. Uh, so it's a great market and they do an, an excellent job. Our focus has been 400 volts and under. Uh, and that's, that's where we intend to stay for now. Thank you, Alex. A question to all. For most device, is positive gate dielectric is getting charged and VTH will change? So, so if I may, I think that that's, um, yeah. th there's, there's some confusion on that. Um, in most uh, devices, and I, I can speak that uh, that's true for for um, devices, for example, at, at uh, EPC and at Navitas, uh, uh, there is no gate dielectric. It's actually a um, a P GAN gate. It's a positively charged uh, gallium nitride, which is not a dielectric, um, and uh, charges uh, inside that are are relatively fixed. So the V-threshold, uh, there might be some slight changing in V-threshold, usually around 100 millivolts is what we see over a lifetime of a device, uh, which is um, uh, related to some internal charges that move around. Uh, but, uh, but that's about it. Yeah, Thank I think you. VT, VTH changes more with uh, process and temperature. Thank you, gentlemen. In the EPC reliability report, it's reported that Switching increases dynamic are on in low voltage GAN devices. Is the percentage increase in dynamic are on for 650 volt devices compared for low voltage device? So that has to go to somebody doing 650 volt. Well, I, um, just to prove that Alex isn't the only guy with a, a deep deck and a deep presentation deck and an encyclopedic memory of what's in them, uh, I've actually got a slide here that I can throw up. Um, how, do I, how do I do that in the tool? Oh, I can share screen. So here's what we're seeing. Um, now, this isn't, I don't think we've done as uh, comprehensive a test suite, perhaps, as uh, Alex was showing. It's not a 10-year thing. It's a minutes thing. Uh, so if you look 1500 minutes, we started hitting this thing and we stopped hitting it um, after uh, 9 million events. And this is at 750 volts. This is the rated voltage of the part. Um, although we, in the application, it very rarely gets uh, over 650 volts. And you'll see the, the effect is small and it seems to recover. Uh, so I was actually intrigued by Alex's comment earlier about it's a false recovery. Uh, what we ought to do, I think, on, on the next time we run this test is, you know, hit it again and see if it has a similar profile. But from our point of view, it's a, what's this? This is a, like a two and a half percent effect at rated voltage. And then it goes away. Thank you, Dick. In, in our, uh, in our uh, latest reliability reports online, you'll see the, um, uh, the basic calculation 
of uh, trapping, uh, what, what uh, you know, how trapping rates um, change with temperature, time, current frequency, and everything like that. So um, that can be used at 650 volts. It can be used at, at any voltage. And it's based on basic mm -hmm. physical parameters. If you know your electric fields uh, in, inside your device, you can apply this model and actually tell what your dynamic on resistance will be. Yeah, I think we simply haven't focused on it because it seemed like such a small um, effect, such a minor effect. Uh, but, um, so it hasn't been, a, uh, hasn't been a major concern. The other good thing about it is because it goes away, it seems to be a high line problem. And in a way a flyback works, as most of our products are flyback related, when you have a very high input voltage, you don't care about RDS on anyway, uh, the losses are dominated by switching losses. And then when it, if the voltage comes back down again, the, um, when RDS on does become a factor, of course you, you've got very low voltage applied and the um, uh, dynamic RDS on such as it is, uh, goes away. So it's a, a virtuous effect in the, uh, in the flyback, plus it's small. Thank you, Dak. So a question to Didier from Nexperia. How does the no. LV yeah. lithium fed QRR influence the cascode performance? Okay, I understand where, where the question is coming from. So how does the low voltage silicon fed that's been used in a cascode uh, and obviously low voltage silicon because the silicon fat, it has got a QRR, but how does it influence the cascode performance? Um, yeah, I think that there is a myth that because we use within the cascode arrangement, a low voltage silicon fat, and how does it compare to a silicon super junction high voltage uh, MOSFET? But this is of the order of, um, if I give you some numbers, probably it will help you. Uh, the, at the low voltage silicon that we use for is uh, about a 14 million device. Uh, the low voltage silicon uh, QRR is of the order of uh, 15 to 20 nanocoulomb, the QRR. But if you compare that one to a 650 volt uh, super junction device, it's actually 2,700. It's almost like a 2.7 uh, microcoulomb compared to uh, the silicon fat. So 2,700 versus about 15 to 20 nanocoulomb is virtually negligible. So uh, the low voltage silicon that we use, which has got a very small, um, the uh, drift region has got a very small QRR and, and it is negligible and it, its impact is nothing uh, within the cascode structure. So it is dominated by the capacitive output QSS rather than QRR. So the QRR impact is uh, negligible. Thank you, Didier. Another question to Dak Bailey. Okay. Uh, yeah, it looks like a, uh, hang on a second. Um, well, I think everybody's on this call is probably more than well, uh, more than familiar with the advantages of GAN in general. It's, it's all about efficiency. So, you know, in terms of our plans, it's hard for me to um, reveal anything specific. But what I can say is that we're so enamored of GAN uh, and its capability that most of our new products will be GAN related. Um, so, you know, in the cadence of how, how quickly we, we release products, um, the, the new products from power integrations will almost all be uh, GAN products. Um, we, we're using GAN for, for everything. Uh, and the reason for that is this, uh, the focus on efficiency and elimination of heat sinks. The intent here is to make sure that when an engineer reaches for the um, extruded aluminum and hacksaw, he has, a, uh, he has another alternative, and that would be to replace the device that he's using and think carefully about whether he, he really should be wasting energy and, and coupling coupling energy that he doesn't need into the environment, um, what, what we believe is that you should be using a, a technology and techniques that don't require the heat sink in the first place. So using GAN, get rid of the heat sink, save energy, be efficient, and uh, you know, think about what you're doing. If you're using a heat sink, you're probably doing it wrong. 
is the way I would think about it. Heat sinks are a symbol of, of waste. Get rid of I that. love it. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Thank that you, was my Dick. little soapbox speech there. I'm sorry. Keep I talking, Doug. Keep talking. For a moment. <laughs> Keep talking. Alex, a question about dynamic on resistance for 200 volt devices. Yes, we do. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, I'm going to show you uh, to, to uh, qualify. These are 200 volt devices, and you'll see them taken up to 280 volts, uh, but you'll also see a 200 volt line. Um, so this is um, showing you at, at uh, um, in this case, uh, the one on the left is at room temperature. The one on the right is at two different temperatures. Uh, even though it says it's 125 C on, on there, that's an error. Um, so you can see that, uh, you know, about 12% uh, change in 15 years at 200 volts. And uh, you can see if you take it up to about 280 volts, you can get a very rapid rise in on resistance um, uh, over time. But this actually, if you look at the 280 volt line, that's millions and millions and millions of cycles. Uh, at 100 kilohertz, if you go to 10 to the three minutes, um, you're, what are you looking at? Uh, 10 to the six, uh, to several millions of cycles uh, um, uh, going on there. So, um, you know, it, 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 it certainly can take a few transients, uh, even at 280 volts, but at 200 volts on resistance is a negligible increase over the life of the product. Thank you, Alex. A question to Tom. How does gate source loop impedance vary between a GAN discrete and a discrete GAN or multi-chip modules. What are the pros and cons of monolithic integration of the driver and FET all in GAN? Hey, that's a great question. I too have a slide, but I don't have an encyclopedia like Alex, I just happen to have the slide open, so I got lucky. Uh, here's some comparisons here. That's a great question. Um, it's obviously a big topic for us at Navitas because we do offer the integrated gate drive. Um, so if you look at the slide here, I mean, this, are, this, this is all from public papers, um, nothing here that we're, you know, this is all common knowledge, it's out there in technical papers available to everybody. Um, you have the discrete GAN here and you have a gate driver here. Um, as soon as you touch this gate down to the PCB, that's where all of these parasitics and also internal parasitics to the package, um, you, you have basically a whole network of parasitics here that come into play. You have gate loop inductance here going from your driver to your uh, gate of your discrete. That's along the, uh, that can come through the, wi the, the wire bond and the pin of the gate driver, then along the PCB trace, um, then that goes to your discrete GAN, and then that goes inside the package. You have also wire bond inductance there until you finally get to the discrete device. Um, and then down in the source path, that goes down to uh, the source connection to the PCB. You also have um, some gate loop inductance here. And then going back along the PCB again, along that ground path back to the gate driver, you have more inductance here. And then that goes up back into the gate driver, back to the pin, back to the return path of the gate driver inside the IC here inside the package. So all of this combined, um, you know, there's also more capacitances than what's shown here. You basically have a, a uh, resonant network that's formed by all these parasitics. So when you switch now here, a, a square wave at the gate drive output, you can imagine what's gonna happen here uh, um, out in your circuit. You're gonna get all sorts of ringing. Um, you're gonna get some gate spikes. Uh, and this will then lead to probably usually what we've seen is some false switching um, and also some false turn on, some false turn off and also EMI problems. And then eventually that gate stress can cause the device to fail over a lifetime or it can also happen instantly that you get just a very high power loss. So 
Um, for a discrete GAN, you really have to keep this distance very, very tight on your PCB. Even then, um, it's not enough. And that's why, uh, you know, just bringing, once you touch that gate out to the PCB, that's where you're going to have these problems. Um, then obviously what we do at Navitas is we have the gate driver integrated. So this loop here to the gate is actually on the IC itself. There's virtually zero uh, gate loop inductance in this path. So we have very clean square wave switching without um, any ringing or glitching or any of these types of problems. Yeah, maybe I could uh, also uh, stand on the shoulders of a, of a giant here, if I could, for a second. Maybe share my screen. I just want to yeah, please you know, add uh, to that in a half bridge circuit. This is what it looks like. And I've circled all those parasitic inductances. Uh, and uh, I know that, uh, well, at EPC, we have a, a fully integrated power stage uh, that integrates all of the uh, drivers and level shift elements. And therefore, all of these uh, um, parasitic inductances that are circled here are actually eliminated in the monolithic device, uh, which I'm sure I can show somewhere down here. Uh, and we also quantify all the impacts. What I'm showing you, by the way, is, uh, is a chapter from our new book, uh, which will come out uh, in October. Um, but uh, this, this monolithic power stage um, uh, basically eliminates all of those inductances. And when you look at it in terms of what it does for your system, this is showing actual comparison between discrete devices with a, uh, a driver that's not integrated uh, versus a fully monolithic power stage. Uh, the green is the monolithic power stage. The blue is the, um, the discrete implementation with all the same electrical characteristics. Uh, this is a 40 to 12 volt buck converter and the uh, solid lines are running at a megahertz. So it makes a big difference to get rid of all those inductances. Uh, and you cannot do it, uh, even with an extraordinarily efficient layout on a, on a PCB. I'm sorry, Alex, what, you, what you're saying is that because you don't have the inductances, you don't have to um, snub them, and that's where the efficiency comes from? It actually comes from uh, the, the parasitic inductances tend to slow everything down. Uh, and that's, that's really limiting your ultra-efficient switching. Um, there, are, there are a few other effects that are in here. Um, one of them is that you can uh, make your dead time almost nothing uh, if you do it monolithically, uh, because you control all your delay times and uh, you have no delay that's you know, from the drivers and, and all this kind of thing. So you truly can get this thing tuned up to a much better frequency. There's also another, uh, I'll say, a hidden, hidden thing in there. When you have a step down DC to DC, you tend to have um, asymmetric heating. Your, your upper device will typically get hotter than your lower device. And if you monolithically integrate all of it, the uh, driver section becomes a thermal tank uh, and the upper and lower FETs uh, tend to a, a lower overall temperature, which tends to lower your on resistance at higher currents as well. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, interesting chart. I hadn't realized the effect would be quite as marked as that. That's impressive. We were surprised. Uh, if, you, if you go back uh, and, and look at a lot of our, our stuff, we actually step-by-step step, uh, showed this uh, several years ago. We actually compared discretes versus just a monolithic half bridge, and there was a big effect. That's when we first discovered the, uh, the effect of the thermal tank um, and also the effect of power loop inductance, which tends to uh, not just cause a lot of EMI, but it also slows down the, uh, the switching at a very critical time generates more heat. Yeah, is this a synchronous buck effect or do you think it works in sort of the more res resonant half bridges that are the more likely a, to be used in the high voltage it's a synchronous, application? It's a synchronous buck effect. It's a hard switching yeah. effect, most of this, yeah. yeah so we, now everybody can go out the, and buy this uh, book. Go buy the book, it's coming out in October. <laughs> All right, mate, you mate, you've got to make your pitch for your book. When's the book signing, Alex? <laughs> For you, any day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we minimize the loops by putting, um, by doing the modules. So I think the question went back to, is it, uh, you know, whether you have an integrated driver with the GAN or whether it's a multi-chip module. Uh, we have a multi-chip module. We, we use silicon to drive the, uh, the GAN nitride device. And the reason we do that is simply cost related. We, we want to make sure that we're 
um, using um, horses for courses. So we, we we make the driver out of silicon and the uh, the gallium nitride device is purely the switch. Thank you. Now, the next question is addressed to Didier. Considering GAN fats for automobiles. Right. Uh, thank you, Bodo. Um, yeah, obviously, the, we've been in automotive industry and from our power uh, BG business group, about more than 60% of our business is actually with automotive. And we have got the history of uh, more than 20 years making copper clipped version of the device within the silicon. And we have extended our uh, copper clip within the GAN environment to reduce the, um, uh, the package resistance significantly along with the other benefits like board level reliability and temperature cycling reliability and high current carrying capability. Yes, all our copper clipped uh, packaging and that we are uh, preparing for are to qualify to automotive grade. Uh, we have released uh, some products within the 2247, which is a historical package, but our main aim is to re um, qualify all of our power GAN devices in copper clip packaging with 175 degrees C uh, junction temperature and um, automotive grade, ACQ 101 and beyond, along with all the wide band gap related uh, qualification and testing performed. Could I uh, just show, show also, uh, you know, EPC has a, uh, a full range of automotive certified products uh, in chip scale package, which uh, I think they're the first chip scale that, that are AEC Q101 qualified and are running around on cars this very day. Thank you. Okay. That's an interesting question. So, yeah, it, it, once again, this diverges a little bit from the GAN other than it's a... Um, a lot of these USB PD adapters yeah. are using uh, GAN technology. Um, what will be the next standard interface? I, I don't think there will be, in a, certainly in the short term, a new physical standard, but USB PD has been upgrading the standard. There's a new one out, um, the extended power range that can go up to 200 watts. And that is obviously right in the sweet spot of where GAN, uh, GAN can help. Uh, uh, in the, the small adapters, you know, 18 to 20 watts and so on, you, you don't really need a GAN device because it doesn't bring you any uh, size benefits. But for once you get up into the higher power ranges and certainly towards 200 watts, I think it's going to be helpful. So USB PD, by, I think they're going to be continuing to work on the protocols and the size, uh, the, the power levels. Uh, and GAN has, a, has clearly an impact on the... Uh, um, utility of those products, but I, I, I don't think they're going to be changing the interface. I'm kind of hoping it goes to uh, wireless power after uh, after this, uh, but uh, I think there are a lot of uh, variables <laughs> to be to to get through first. Yeah, I think it boils down to end-to-end -end efficiency. I think, uh, at the moment, wireless power seems to be an end-to-end -end efficiency in the low 70s, and uh, that just uh, it just sort of feels bad to be. Uh, uh, issuing products in 70% efficiency level for charging these days. I, I think there needs to be some, some movement towards you know, 90% or better for the, for the efficiency end-to-end. -end. That's when it I'd feel more comfortable about wireless being the, the right answer for everybody. Yeah, I agree. I, I definitely agree with that. Okay. We are at the end of the question that have been addressed to us. We can talk a little bit if you have internal something that we should share, but I've seen that Alex, Dak, and Didier, and Tom went quite deep into the technology, and our audience got a great information and we will continue on a quarterly base to do this tech talk to reflect what had been published in articles in my magazine uh, to get the audience more 
detailed information and that they can raise questions for better understanding. So I will say thank you to the presenter and I will say thank you to the audience and will thank you. Have a great day here. It's the afternoon and your area of the world, the day is starting. So enjoy the day in California and uh, we'll be soon again on a call for sharing information.